Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Ham Nation is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Ham Nation is brought to you by Casper, an online retailer of premium mattresses for a fraction of the price. Because everyone deserves a great night's sleep. Get $50 off any mattress purchase by visiting casper.com slash hamnation and enter promo code hamnation. And by DX Engineering. DX Engineering offers practically everything you need to outfit your shack plus the fastest shipping in the industry. In-stock items ship the same day, Monday through Friday until 10 p.m. Eastern. For more information, visit dxengineering.com slash hamnation. And by ICOM. For more information, visit icomamerica.com slash hamnation. This is Ham Nation, episode 194 for April 29th, 2015. Meet the Twin Hams. Hello, everybody. Yep, it's me, K9EID. I haven't been here so long. I had to almost look how to do this, but we're here, and boy, have we got some stuff tonight. It's going to be a biggie. And we've got, of course, the usual good guys. Let me run it around the horn real fast and say hello to, to Gordo down in Costa Mesa. How are you, Gordo? Uh, we are fine. We're getting ready to head out for the Nevada State Convention, which is uh, this coming weekend, May 1, 2, and 3. Also, this coming weekend, uh, Bob, we're going to have a lot of stations uh, on the air uh, for N4V, special event station commemorating the 40th anniversary of the end of of the Vietnam War. So we're going to be busy both uh, on the road as well as working a lot of these stations. Back to you, Bob. Yeah, okay. We've got uh, got some really neat things there with the Vietnam thing. I know that for sure. Uh, Don, how are you doing? Everything all right down there in the Mississippi and New Orleans? Yeah, well, we had a tornado go through and 111 mile an hour winds and, and a train get blown 60 feet off a bridge. But other than that, it's been just <laughs> fine. But the thing that's bothering me more than anything is I see you've got this DX engineering shirt on and, and Gordon has this DA and I've got this. Uh, why are we all dressed? This is like going to a party and, and seeing someone else in this. Oh, geez, Christian, too. Oh, no, I, yeah, oh, no. I just I, I'm not sure I can continue. No, no, we're going to start the uh, Honorable Leo Laporte bowling team, and this is the nucleus. Oh, good. We can drink and smoke cigars while we play that I'm in. Absolutely. Yes. Bring your your best uh, right hand or left hand and the heaviest ball with three holes in that you got, okay? I use my head. You got it? Yeah, I use my head. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh golly well i'm glad to be back glad you're doing okay other than all that nonsense that's passed you by christian how are things in st louis everything calm these days nice to have you with us thanks for having me things are great welcome back dr bob great to see everybody tonight and uh i've been really listening when i can listening to the nepal relief effort at least what the hams are doing and uh, it's really compelling radio, I have to say. I don't know if we'll touch on that tonight. I've been recording a little bit of it, too. I don't know if you guys are doing that or not. But for me, being on the radio for such a long time, it's, you know, it's really compelling, moving stuff. So anyway, not to get too heavy, but uh, that's what I've been doing. I've, I've been listening a lot. All right. And you've got a great interview with a pair of twins that are licensed hams. Is that right? Two for one tonight. Two for one. You said go out and find me some new blood. So we've got two hams for the price of one tonight. So we'll give you that in just a bit. Looking forward to that. Uh, Well, we're going to run through some pictures of where I've been. So I can I can verify that I've really been working or having fun and whatever. So Brian, let's go through these. First of all, I did uh, I did four conventions in three days. 
And the first wow. one was the NMX. That's that's a show that is it's a podcast show, and they now have put it with NAB. The National Association of Broadcasters are finally figuring it out. Podcasters are real, and this convention was huge. About one hundred and ten thousand people. I don't know. It was crazy in uh, Las Vegas. So um, that that really worked for us. I'm happy that uh, we got to go there. And the next slide for us, Brian, let's see what we got. Uh, we had a booth there that was um, at the NMX uh, show. It was busy the whole time. It was really busy. So uh, let's go next and see what's happening. Look who shows up at the booth. Whoa. It's Alex. Yeah. We had a good time. And uh, he had some of the other guys from uh, Twit with him also. And there was Randy. Randy shows up. Uh, and so we had a lot, of, a lot of broadcasters there and podcasters. So I was happy to see them. I did a workshop, of course. I, I love teaching and sharing the science. You can see all the many sponsors of, this, uh, of, of the, uh, the whole technical side of podcasting. It, it was great. And we got on an airplane, uh, another airplane, and uh, flew to L.A., then to Fres uh, Fresno and rented a car and ended up there in Visalia where I, I set up the booth. And look who shows up when I get the booth. Aha, Valerie and Jerry. And so we, uh, we had, had a lot of fun at this. Uh, and look who else showed up. It's Mike, WT6H. So all the players were there. We had a good time. And uh, it, it was one of those really cool shows. That is Bob often. And, and Fred, the, these are guys from K1N. He, he's, the, he's the main man that figures it all out and uh, helps get it all together. And, of course, we uh, talked about them using the Pro 7. And uh, a lot of Ham Nation uh, fans were there. And, and, and they had on the right kind of shirt, I guess. <laughs> I was so happy to see some of them there. That was cool. And, uh, and this is Sharon. Sharon's been on Ham Nation, her and uh, Wayne, K6IRD and W6IRD. They're a great DX couple. And that's Rick, W0RIC. Of course, these are big DXers, big DXers. And this is a, a group, uh, just a small group, uh, of school children. You're going to hear much more about that later. Valerie's got a whole story about them. Uh, it's really incredible uh, what's going on. You'll have a whole story, but we had fun with, with the headsets. One of my longtime friends from uh, St. Louis, he now lives in Arizona, uh, W0CZE and Sharon. They're all getting ready for the banquet. And the banquet was huge. There was 700 people at this banquet. It was a record. They broke, broke a lot of records. There were 852 at Visalia this year. So they broke a lot of records. And this, I have been waiting to meet him for a long time. This is W6 Charlie, Charlie, Charlie. And if you listen to 20 meters at all, you've heard Seymour. Big signal. He usually likes to work across the pole and do long path. He's just a fabulous guy. And I was really glad to be able to meet Seymour. And that, that, uh, that was my time in good old Visalia and Las Vegas and everywhere else. So we had a really great time and saw so many of the fans. That, I guess that's part of the, the fun of going to these shows and meeting a lot of the fans. So uh, I'm glad that I could share a little bit of that with you. And Gordo, you knew just about everybody on that slideshow. I bet you you knew Seymour, didn't you? Go ahead, Gordo. Well, I've certainly heard Seymour and many of the other operators that you uh, showed. And uh, wow, what a great time. Hey, Bob, congratulations to Angela. Angela's visually impaired added a lot to our latest audio course and added a lot to our quest for trying to find a home for these Chinese orphan radios, which we'll talk about in a second. Angela, congratulations on Extra KM4FCF. 
For those of you thinking of starting a ham radio club newsletter, here's a ham that says, let me help you. And he says, all you got to do is go to hamclubonline.com, hamclubonline.com. And he's going to help you uh, decide maybe there's some great software to get those club newsletters out and minutes of the meetings and things like that. Wow, we uh, got plenty of uh, comments on FC uh, on USC uh, Code of Federal Regulations Part 17.17. .17, make that 77.17. .17, all about tower heights. And in the next few weeks, we'll talk about the Code of Federal Regulations and how it applies to those hams living by an airport. So thanks everyone for getting me that information. Well, let me tell you. Thanks, everybody, to adding to the huge file of the Chinese orphans. And we had uh, half and half, half the folks that uh, wrote me, WB6NOA at ARRL.net, said, don't pick on them. They're cheap. They work if you know how to work them. And they're a good investment for like $39 or $49. Don't beat them up. And I'm really not. The Chinese radios are incredible deals. I mean, Amazon had them for uh, about $34 on some of the closeouts. What we're trying to do is to come up with a way that we can get these new, small, inexpensive handhelds in the hands of brand new hams pre-programmed. That's the key. Get them pre-program. So keep those comments coming. Um, I'm reading about which ones are easy and which ones are more difficult to program. Everybody seems to love the RT system software. And uh, again, uh, I want to say that uh, PowerWorks, which makes uh, the marketing of these two units, do a great job of not uh, selling orphan radios. They stand behind these radios. They'll help folks with programming issues, with uh, antenna issues, and uh, PowerWorks, we commend you. Also, Radio City, another great ham dealer that's doing a great job. So they deserve your attention. So keep me posted on Chinese radios because I would sure like to give a full report in about two weeks on which radios have the best results, who's using which software to get them programmed, and most important, how to get your local club into the programming queue so that we can get these radios to the new students and get them on the air. So that's the story at this end. We're off to Nevada. We'll see everybody next week. Bob, back to you. Okay, Gordo. Uh, you, you know, on Saturday morning, I do a radio show here on a, an FM radio station for half an hour about amateur radio. Been doing it since November. And Sarah, uh, who owns Heil Sound, she wanted to get m more hams in, involved in amateur radio, more people involved in amateur radio. She worked a deal where they can get your book and one of those Chinese handy talkies for 50 bucks. Wow. A hundred people in and around Springfield, Missouri, have them. 45 of them have gone to classes here, and we have 45 new hams since the first of the year. There's three classes that start up in May to uh, take them up, uh, uh, the rest of them uh, up to uh, technician, and they're starting classes for general. That, that That's amazing to me. Why is this not happening all over the country? Uh, there's all kinds of talk shows looking for a program. You might want to check around and see if your local radio station that has talk radio would like to have a show on amateur radio. Do it. You can do it. Uh, and look what's happened. Man, we're so thrilled. And uh, I'll keep you posted, but there's a whole lot of those running around <laughs> Springfield, and they're on the air, and they're ready for the tornadoes because this is Tornado Alley. I'm really excited about it, and uh, we're, we're, we're thrilled that, that uh, the guys here uh, uh, have put all their efforts together to do classes and using your book and so we're we're on the on the move here in Springfield but talking about on the move we're gonna move up to St. Louis because a fascinating reports coming up here with Christian but uh, 
uh, this is not just uh, an everyday report. I really appreciate you putting this all together, Christian. So uh, take it over. I think you're going to do something about Casper first, but it's all yours. Well, I, uh, I, I, I think the handy talky thing conversation that you were having is important. And uh, to bring up this Nepal situation again, there was such a push and urgency to try to get just a simple handheld handy talky to the sites. So, so they're very important. It's an entry level way in, I think, for new technicians. Um, but it, it's also very important now. I mean, they're looking for communications and that's what they needed. And so it's on the way. Uh, speaking of this new ham segment, uh, a little bit ago, you, you said to me, you know, let's start looking for ham stories, new hams. They don't have to be kids. They can be newcomers. They could be upgrades. And, you know, so we ask for stories and we still do. And we're looking for, you know, just send an email. Dr. Bob Gordo at all sort of comes to me and, and we look for the best stories. This one, uh, Dr. Bob said, you know what? Look at the cover of the magazine here. It's a it's a set of twins. And you went on to talk about uh, triplets that you had worked back in, I think, the late 50s. But this time they came to us. They were on the cover of the magazine. So I want to introduce you to two new young hams tonight on ham nation well this week i've got some bona fide celebrities celebrities okay only on the big show do we get the celebrities like that joe kc3 csi and james kc3 csh so tell me a little bit about this i mean this is this is awesome i mean come on <laughs> On the cover of QST? That's great. Congratulations. Well, uh, we were up at our Radio Shack Skyview, um, a radio club, Skyview, um, and we were we got the chance to work W on AW Stroke 3 for, and for the week. And that was one of the days we were up there, and our, 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 the, our mentor, uh, Cook, uh, Bob, as we know him by Cookie, um, WC3O, uh, he took the picture and sent it into uh, QST, and uh, they accepted it and put it on the cover. So, so what were your jobs during this particular event? I can see you guys are working in tandem. You got another fellow there helping you out. What were your roles on that day? We really didn't have roles. We were just um, working. We were just working uh, uh, the bands that we had the chance to work. I'm pretty sure we were both working ready. Yeah, in that time. So, uh, uh, yeah, we didn't really have roles. We just had the chance to work when we got the chance to. So, or we just worked when we got the chance. And the uh, fellow in the back, that, that's his name's Chuck Mills. We got hit. We got in touch with him and know him from uh, um, one of the um, Silent Keys. He got ours. Uh, got a couple antennas that we got, um, and we were work. He was working phone, and we were working ready at the time. And we don't have ready, but we haven't. We don't have ready set up on our shack yet. We are um, still working at that. So your dad is also a ham. Is that where your interest began, or did you guys? How did you guys come about this? Well, our our dad was like in the CP as a kid, and his like a couple friends or neighbors got him in, and he got his license, and then um, he like saw it like two years ago. And we were thinking like, he was thinking like, oh, we should study for this and get our generals. And and I took, we took the test on uh, in April of last year. And um, I and my dad passed his general and he passed, I passed my tech and general and James here passed his tech. And we got, we started working. And then so shortly we were at um, a lo local ham fest and James passed his um, general. And that's what we are, whole generals right now. We're going to um, start working for our extra class, too. That's excellent. And just to let our audience know, these are identical twins here, of course. Joe is in the white. James is in the red. So uh, as we go forward, uh, I won't confuse it now. I'm glad you wore colors. I was like, they, are gonna, they could possibly do this to me. But you guys have been through this enough, I'm sure. And yes. it's, if you see uh, any pictures of me, I'm usually the one wearing red. I love red as my color, so. Okay, got it. Good tip, by the way. So you're closest here on the cover of the magazine, for Pete's yeah. sake. Now, do you guys have separate 
interest? Are you both pretty much into the same things right now? I mean, this is a vast hobby. We can do a lot of different things. We can build antennas. We can collect QSL cards. We can work DX and contesting. What are you guys into? Are you into the same things or different things? Well, at the moment, we are basically into the same thing. We um, have recently uh, got up to um, working CW, and right now we're around um, 15 to 20 words a minute. Wow. Um, and we only started, what, six weeks ago, seven weeks ago? And um, we right actually before you called, we were QRP uh, straight key um, trying to get some contacts. Unfortunately we, unfortunately, we didn't get one, but that's um, the struggle when you're working QRP. Um, but yeah, we've been working CW and we have a lot of contacts. Half of my QSL cards are CW contacts now. So yeah, we, we have this class at um, our club that uh, Bob Bastone, um, WC30 runs and every Monday night they have it on um, our repeater and on 28-102 every night, uh, every Monday night. And it's a um, good, good process to get you up. I want to talk about your club a little bit, and you can give the name here after I give you this question, because I've read a little bit and I've talked to some people. I found you through your club. Uh, Of course, I saw you on the front of the magazine and was interested, but your club really does some great things like the Elmer Night and where you can build some different things. Tell us a little bit about your club and why that means something to you. Well, our club, uh, Skyview Amateur Radio Society, um, or K3MJW, um, they we have been gone up there since um, January of last year and um, learned a, a bunch of things. There's a ni- lot of nice people up there, great, um, great Elmers and about and um, that have taught us a lot of things. The Elmer Knights, if you see on the website, um, they have um, a bunch of pictures of us working um, as building like small projects like a Humana Light um, and things like like a small um, Kier and things like that. We built a tiny uh, an antenna, a quick build antenna. Yep. And we have like we, um we also switches and things like that too. Switches, yeah. yeah. Um, they are all pro um pros- projects that we can work on at um at at the club. Yeah. Do you guys have individual rigs? Or are you both sharing a rig at home now in the shack? At the moment, we're sharing a rig, as you can see behind us. Um, that's the only rig we have, but at the club, there are several rigs we can work. So when we're up there on Tuesday nights, every Tuesday night, we have a um, special meeting and um, we go up there and you can each work your own own band and your own um, area at, at one time. But right now we're only working one station here. Um, how, how does that work? Do you guys share it? Do you do like a timeshare thing or do you team up? How, how do you guys work out who's doing We usually what? just take turns. Like if we would someone would be calling cq sometimes we're not back here all together and one person would work the radio but if we're both back here then one person would call cq or if they're we're searching and pouncing we would contact in person and the next person would talk to them and then we would both have the same per people that we talk to so that's great congratulations on your upgrade and everything you've done and getting yeah, on the magazine you guys look so serious and focused uh, I would like to join your team. Could Do you have a spot? There is a chair that I could maybe <laughs> yeah. sit in and just watch you guys work. That would be kind of cool. Yeah, we have, everyone's welcome at our club. And um, thank you. It, it's a pleasure um, having this opportunity to um, talk to you. And um, it's a pleasure working at our, our club. It's there. There's a lot of cool things to do. Can we make a contact on like 20 meters or 15 that, where I get on and work you guys? I think that's a cool aspect of this whole segment is... I get to meet new friends and new people, and we get to work on the air together. So maybe I'll find you, Joe, KC3CSI, and James, KC3CSH. And congratulations on all of your success. I hope to work you a little bit further down the coax, as they say. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we'd, look, we'd be looking forward to working you, too. 7-3, guys. I'll talk to you again soon, okay? Okay, 7-3. Yep, well, there you have it, Don. I mean, 15 to 20 <laughs> words a minute of CW. Wow. I'm like, oh, wow. they don't want me on that team right now. I need some study. But <laughs> impressive wow. 13-year-old boys in really sharp mind, really focused and working hard at it. So it was a pleasure to meet those guys.
Man, I can barely spell CW, much less do 15 words a minute. <laughs> Scary. Good stuff. That's a, that's a great segment, Christian. I'm glad you've become part of the team because I'm just, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm thoroughly impressed with, with you and everything you do and professionally and now in this too and, and bringing these new hams to the forefront. This is just, this is just the best. Well, I want to talk about right now, um, we have a new sponsor to Ham Nation. It's called Casper. And no, it's not the friendly ghost, but uh, it is very soft and very white and very light. You're going to love it. Casper is an online retailer of premium mattresses. And you can buy these mattresses for a fraction of the cost. This is absolutely revolutionizing the mattress industry. It's cutting the cost of dealing with resellers and showrooms and passing the savings directly on to the consumer. There is, uh, there, there's the box that it comes in. It's amazing. It comes in in a fairly small box. There it is. Look at that. This, there's a mattress in there. It, it's obsessively engineered and a great price. Two technologies working together, latex and memory foam, gives you better nights and brighter days. It's a comfortable mattress, has just the right sink and bounce. And you can see just how easy it is to get this thing set up. It's not like some big truck is going to come to your house and, and you know, workers are going to come in and do the uh, traipse all through your house. And No, oh my God, oh, here we go, look at there. It's got the, there it is, the Leo Woo! flop test. So, yep, it's a comfortable mattress. And you can see right there, it has just the right sink and bounce. There's proof positive right there. Sorry, Leo. Casper Mattress provides long-lasting comfort and support and uh, just amazing. You can buy it easily online, completely risk-free. And, of course, Casper understands the importance of trying out a mattress. You know, you got to sleep on it. Uh, you can sleep on it tonight. And it's not just a 10-minute or 10-second little thing in the store either. They give you a 100-day uh, period, so you can definitely test it out. And it's free delivery and painless returns, a 100-day test sleep. And did you know that statistically lying on a bed in a showroom has absolutely no correlation as to whether or not it's the right bed for you? You need to sleep on this, and you need to sleep on it for many nights in a row before you can realize that it is the one for you, and this will be the one for you. And all of Casper's mattresses are made in the USA. So give them a shot. Get a Casper mattress, 500 bucks for a twin, 950 for a king. Compared to uh, industry averages, that's a, an amazing price. And you can save an additional 50 as one of the Ham Nation viewers by going to casper.com slash ham nation, entering the code ham nation. Casper.com slash ham nation. And then at the promo code during checkout, ham nation. So uh, get a good night's sleep and get it with Casper. Leo Laporte gave it the... Uh, Gave it the flop test, and I think it passed. I usually give stuff the greasy thumbprint of approval. Leo, I'm not sure what he gave it the approval with, but he gave it the approval. And so go to casper.com slash ham nation and try it out. Now let's go check out the news of the week with Amateur Radio Newsline. From Amateur Radio Newsline report number 1,962, these are the Ham Nation headlines for Wednesday, April 29th, 2015. After being released in Australia Monday, April 6th, the foil party balloon called PS-41 has achieved the longest range in Project Pico Space and has circled the globe. Skeeter Nash in 5ASH. This became official on Thursday, April 16th, as PS-41 crossed the 144.903 degree longitude, marking a completion of its epic voyage. Brian Pliatios, VK3GR of the WIA News reports. The latest solar-powered helium-filled balloon, PS41, launched by Andy Nguyen, VK3YT, on April 6, has a HF payload transmitting 25 milliwatts on the 30-metre and 20-metre bands, sending whisper spots and JT9 telemetry. This high-altitude balloon took a path over Tasmania, then south of New Zealand, the southern tip of South America, directly over the South Georgia and southern Sandwich Islands, well south of Africa, and back to Australia, where it began. While south of Tasmania, it abruptly changed course instead of heading straight across its initial path. Andy Nguyen, VK3YT, says the balloon PS41 tracked extensively via JT9 by a network in VK, ZL, South America and South Africa and Ireland. Whisper spots have been received all over the world. The emergency medical evacuation of a sick radio amateur from Pagasa Island was delayed for several days after a Chinese naval vessel reportedly harassed a Philippine Air Force patrol flight. Leo Almazan, WA6LOS, a member of the Mabue DX group, told interocasian.com they had gone to Pagasa to set up an amateur radio operation and to test a portable solar power system. They were also to conduct a small-scale medical mission, as one of their members is a doctor. 
Over the weekend, one of the team members, Cheeto Pastor, WW6CP, came down with a kidney infection from drinking the highly saline local water after the supply of drinking water the ham radio enthusiasts had brought with them ran out. The morning of Monday, April 20th, Almazan said the Philippine Navy was getting ready to send an Islander aircraft to fly Pastor off Pagasa for medical treatment. The Mercy flight was canceled after a Chinese frigate fired an illumination round on a military patrol aircraft. But although the rescue aircraft was later cleared to fly to Pagasa on Wednesday morning, it developed engine problems and would be delayed. He had received another message from Navy headquarters. It said that a civilian aircraft had been cleared to fly the medical mission on April 23rd. This would be the latest in a long stream of run-ins over the Spratleys, where China has embarked on an aggressive reclamation and construction spree on disputed islands and reefs. The FCC has initiated a proceeding to amend its rules of organization as it applies to amateur radio licensee address information that's routinely available for public inspection. Specifically, the FCC proposes to revise its rules to specify that past amateur radio licensee address information will not be routinely available for public inspection. To implement this change, the FCC proposes to remove from public view in the universal licensing system an amateur radio licensee's address information that is not associated with the current license or pending application. Current licensee address information would remain public. Comments on WT docket number 15-81 are due by June 16th. Reply comments must be filed by July 16th. One of the highlights of the Dayton Hamvention is running into some out-of-this-world people. Case in point, astronauts. According to Carol Perry, WB2MGP, astronaut Mike Fink, KE5AIT, will be coming to speak to her Dayton Hamvention Youth Forum. Also, the American Radio Relay League is sponsoring her eight young presenters to attend a lunch with him afterwards. They will be joined by other young hams chosen from the audience. WB2MGP's Youth Forum is scheduled for Saturday, May 16th from 9.15 to 11.45 in Meeting Room 2 of the Hara Arena in Dayton, Ohio. Astroham Samantha Christopheretti, IZ0UDF, is in orbit and won't be at Dayton, but you can see her on Twitter. Here's Heather Emby, KB3TZD. Friday, April 17th, she shared a selfie on Twitter taken on board the orbiting space laboratory. In it, Christopheretti was dressed as Captain Catherine Janeway of Star Trek Voyager, with a tiny ISS pin in place of the traditional chevron. Over her shoulders, through a viewing window, is the SpaceX Dragon cargo craft that delivers supplies to space station crews. The text of her tweet is an in-joke that fans of the Voyager series will recognize. In the fifth episode, titled The Cloud, when Janeway is told there's energy in a nearby nebula, she quips about her favorite beverage. Followers were giving thumbs up to her selfie, saying that she looks a lot like the famous Delta Quadrant pioneer of Starfleet. Samantha Christopheretti is aboard the ISS to perform several scientific experiments in the space station's microgravity laboratory. Her team study is part of the Futura mission, which was launched November 2014. She'll return to Earth in mid-May. And that's all from the Amateur Radio Newsline, your independent source for amateur radio news for over 37 years and counting at www.arnewsline.org. For Skeeter Nash, N5ASH, Brian Playatzios, VK3GR, and Heather MB, KB3TZD, I'm Don Wilbanks, AE5DW73. We'll see you next time here on Ham Nation. And now, here's Dr. Tamitha Scove with the solar update. Hi, I'm Tamitha Scove with your solar storm forecast for the week of April 30th. With all of the active regions rotating onto the backside and wreaking havoc there, you'd think the Earth-facing sun would be quiet, but it's not. On April 26th, we had an eruption from the near west limb, and now we have one, two, three filaments from the northeast that have erupted near simultaneously, one of them being this huge monster that lifts off here. So now we have four solar storms that look like they're en route, kind of toward Earth, but we'll be lucky to get a glancing blow from any of them. Switching to our M-flare threat meter, you can see we've actually had very little flare activity. We did have a spate of M-class flares back on the 21st and 22nd when region 2322 was about to rotate out of view, but that has since died down. The flare levels have continued to stay low, and they will probably continue that way for some time. Now, we did see a slightly elevated radiation levels of from about the April 22nd through about the 27th, but they stayed well below NOAA's S1 storm level threshold. And so these levels were probably enough to cause maybe a raised noise floor for amateur radio operators and maybe even some GPS issues at high latitudes. But the levels have since died down and we don't expect any more radiation storms uh, in the near future.
Switching to your solar storm levels, you can see the waning effects from that high-speed stream that started dying down around the 17th and the 18th. It's cut since been to about unsettled conditions. Now, we did see active conditions again on the 21st, and that was pretty much from a solar storm that didn't really manifest too much of effects. But things have since then died down, and we've been experiencing very quiet solar wind conditions uh, over the past week. So what else does the sun have in store for us this week? Well, this is our solar wind prediction model, NLL. This is NOAA's version of the model. The top panel's density, the bottom panel's velocity. And here we're modeling the western eruption that we saw back on the 26th. And as you see it coming out, it actually looks like it grazes Earth right about the 1st. So we might actually see a little bit of uh, storming because of this. Now, switching to NASA's version of the model, this is a preliminary run of those eruptions that occurred on the beast limb. And as you can see here, this run shows that that big eruption is actually going to miss Earth onto the east. So we have one eruption that's going east of us, one eruption that's going west of us. If we see anything, it'll be uh, late on the 30th into the 1st, and then for this one, it'll be into the 2nd. So we might see something, but probably not. Switching to our solar flare and particle radiation storm outlook over the coming week. As mentioned earlier, everything is green. We only have region 2331 that has any uh, threat for uh, high level flare at all, and it is rotating off of the west limb. So NOAA is going to be dropping our M flare threat risk down to 1% over the coming week, as, and, and absolutely no threat for radiation storms at all. So, you GPS operators and you amateur radio operators, uh, especially, you should breathe a sigh of relief because it looks like there will be little disturbances, uh, if any at all, over the coming week. So this week it looks like Earth is a bullet dodger. We've got four solar storms en route, but it looks like they're either going to go to the east of us or the west of us. At most, they might graze us here and there, but we're not anticipating any major effects from this, just maybe minor effects. It really depends upon how uh, extended these solar storms are. But on top of that, we have very little flare activity, so pretty much the space weather is quiet this week for a change. So enjoy the quiet. I'm Tamitha Scove. Thank you for watching. All right, there's your news of the week. And, of course, you know, Dr. T is going to be at Dayton as well on the uh, Friday of Dayton at the Antenna Forum that uh, Tim Duffy from DX Engineering has been putting on for some years. And, of course, you can see that live at icomamerica.com as they stream that. Uh, so if you can't be at Dayton Live, you can be there via the ICOM website. And speaking of DX Engineering, the big event, of course, Dayton coming up. And you want to look sharp for Dr. T. And that's why DX Engineering has us looking good for the show tonight in these great new DX Engineering shirts. The Engineering Apparel and Collection Collectible section has hats, shirts, gifts, all kinds of gear for any ham. And these polo shirts... I mean, we look sharp, don't we? They feel good, too. It's a polyester thing, so it's like a performance knit, so it's not going not gonna to get all sweaty and clammy on it because you never know what the weather's going to be like at Dayton, but you need to get one of these. It's a lightweight, breathable polyester weave for outdoor and indoor comfort. It has this mesh on it. Uh, they're men's and women's styles and sizes, and uh, if you're going to lug a bunch of stuff around Dayton, well, they've got DX Engineering gear bags, the tote bag. Uh, can get all your ham fest handouts, a small QRP rig, your HD, field day munchies. It's a heavy grade canvas for uh, rip and tear resistance. The bottom is reinforced to give you the additional weight in case you need to buy some new HD batteries. Inside and outside pockets, secure your small stuff, <laughs> wide straps. You can carry it around comfortably for hours. You know how much you carry around at Dayton, for crying out loud. You put, you put the whole hair arena in that thing. And the sport bag is an ideal travel companion. It'll hold everything. Like I said, spare batteries, cables, tools, even a change of clothes and extra shoes. Uh, the bag has uh, padded foam with big zippered pockets. And there's an umbrella, too, because, you know, you want to keep the rain or the sun off your uh, head in the uh, flea market because you could get both in the same day. You could even get snow. <laughs> it's crazy. But it's perfect for keeping whatever you need to keep off your head, off your head and your neck. 36-inch diameter, collapses to a little tiny compact size, and it includes a carry pouch. And they have uh, gear combos as well to bundle all this stuff together. It's a quick way to outfit yourself in style. The combos include assortments of gear like hats, bags, folding chairs, shirts, more. There are six combos in all. Visit DX Engineering to see them all. It's not all about DX Engineering. Uh, cruise on over to DXEngineering.com. You'll see the gifts, the apparel, the shack, accessories from names like Vibraplex, MFJ, Heil Sound. It's a great place for authentic ham radio gear just in time for Dayton. 
Uh, DX Engineering ships faster, as you know, than anybody else in the industry. Get your order in by 10 o'clock Eastern. That's PM. And if it's in stock, it'll be on a trek headed your way tonight. Proven Products Expert Advice, DX Engineering, helps you shrink the globe. Go grab your catalog or shop online 24-7 at dxengineering.com slash ham nation. Look at this. They've got... Um, They've got uh, they've they've got stickers. If you want to, you know, s stick stuff on your bag, they've got note cubes because you know you gotta you gotta make notes periodically. They've got uh, the the DX engine. This is a great uh, mouse pad. Uh, my whole shack is just full of DX engineering stuff. They got the great DX engineering hat and the stickers. My wife loves the stickers. She puts them all over the house. But there's one place in particular she really likes to put them, and that's. <laughs> Well placed. Well placed. <laughs> Excellent position for that, Don. Your wife knows what she's doing. Well, tonight on Smoke and Solder, we've got a, a video from our friend Randy, K7AGE, and he's going to build a 10 meter dipole for us. Hi, Randy, K7AGE. This is a first of a group of videos aimed towards the technicians, the entry class license, to show them that there's some life be outside of two meters and 70 centimeter FM. I picked up this band plan, uh, the ARL band plan the other day at a local ham fest swap meet, and down here in 10 meters, this bottom line is for the novices and technicians, and the technicians have access between 28.0 and 28.5. Now between 28.0 and 28.3 is CW and data and beacons, and the data part can be PSK31, which is very popular. Between 28.3 and 28.5 is where you can operate sideband. So you can have a lot of fun on 10 meters. So in this first video, I'm gonna show you how to build a 10 meter dipole. Now this is very easy. You, you can go out and spend money and buy a pre-made dipole, or I'm gonna show you how you can build your own. Now I've bought some various bits and pieces, but you may be able to build your own out of some, some plastic and scrape up some wire. So let's look at what the dipole is. So what I'm gonna be talking about is a resonant dipole for 10 meters that could be fed with coax and directly connected to your radio. So this is made up of two pieces of wire of equal length, and we're gonna feed it with coax. So the coax is gonna come up. That's the outer shield, and this is the inner conductor. So the outer shield will connect to one of the wires, and the center conductor will connect to the other. And what we need to do here is look at the overall length for the wire. So this length is equal to 468 divided by your frequency in megahertz. So we're going to have 468, and I'm going to cut the antenna to 28.3, just at the boundary between the data and the voice. 468 divided by 28.3. 0.3 equals 16.5 feet. Each side is half of that, so that'll be eight and a quarter feet, or eight feet, three inches. So from the center out will be eight feet, three inches, and the same over here, eight feet, three inches. So I was at a hand fest swap the other day and I picked up some parts to build antennas, dipoles. I got some insulators for the end. These are the type that the wire would go through on one side and your rope on the other. I also picked up some of these. They were two for a buck. Picked some of these types up. <clears throat> Again, two for a buck. And these are the eggs style. So the, the way these work is that the wire goes through one way and the rope goes through the other but they don't touch, but if the insulator breaks, it'll still hold. I also bought this center insulator uh, for $2, and with this, it's got a couple larger rings in the middle, and you can wrap your coax around there and tie it off, say, with a cable tie, and seal it up with some RTV, and connect your dipole wires to these lugs and run out to you know, the insulators on each end. But I also found this ballon Balin, not Balum, Balin, <clears throat> for five bucks. And <clears throat> this is a um, W2 
UA ballon, and it's written on the bag here 1.1. 1 .1. And um, so this is nice because you can screw a coax uh, SO259 in the bottom, and it has these wires here that you solder onto your dipole wires, which you mechanically tie off to these screw eyes. And if you can hold this up from the center, that would help because this gets to be a lot of weight with the coax. So on the way home from the Hamfest, I stopped by my do-it-yourself home center and I bought 20 feet of 14 gauge stranded wire, insulated. Uh, I've selected red. This was a, less than $5. I think it was $4.96. So this whole thing isn't costing me really more than, uh, you know, about $10 or so. Um, a lot of talk about Insulated versus non-insulated wire for what we're doing. Don't worry about it. 20 feet of something. Get an old extension cord, zip cord, pull the wires apart. That will work too. So this is what I bought. Okay, tools for the project are very simple. A pair of, I have a pair of wire cutter strippers. Uh, I have my soldering gun because I'm going to be, it's a little beefy, so I'm going to use that instead of my iron. I got some solder and I have a tape measure to measure out the wire. And if George was doing this soldering, I'm sure he would have some of his solder flux to put on the joint. I don't have that. Oh, well. Okay, what I'm going to do is just pull this out, loop it around my chair here, and cut it in half. And I'll worry about the actual measuring when we're all done soldering. Okay, so that's 20 feet. Divided it in half is going to be 10. Just going to come down here and cut the wire. So I have the ballon here, and the first thing I'm going to do is these copper wires, I think this is a little old. I'm going to take some sandpaper and kind of brighten those up, get some of that tarnish off from there. Okay, I'm going to strip off about an um, inch of the insulation on each of the wires. There's one. There's the other. I'll just twist these back up. Now I'm going to attach the wire to the uh, ballon. I'm going to have about three inches here, so I'm going to pass it through the uh, screw eye here. And I'm going to bring that through. And then I'm going to just wrap that, uh, wrap the wire around itself, you know, two or three times. And then we'll solder those together. So, we do the same on the other end here. Okay, so I'm going to wrap the two, two wires together here. One of the ballon is pretty stiff. And when I do this, I want to make sure the tension is to the eye bolt and not to the solder. I want this, the mechanical strength to the eye bolt. And I'll just do the same on the other end here as well. And now for the moment we've been waiting for soldering. So the iron is hot and I'm going to place that on there and put the solder, the iron on one side and the solder on the other. If it quit moving around here and that way you know, the heat's transferring through the whole junction and just put a bunch on there. I can see it wicking up towards the wire there. So there's that one and now this one. And there we go. Dipole is just about made. Okay, what I've done is stretch out my wire, my wires and my tape measure on the driveway, and I've left my Sharpie at the eight feet, three inches. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut it long. I'm gonna cut both of these to nine feet. And we'll worry about the exact length when we tune it. So this is the end insulator that I will use. And of course the wire will just go through here and we'll just bring it back and wrap it around on itself. And that's all you have to do. You don't have to cut these. Well, that's all for today. The dipole is basically done. The wires are cut, they're soldered, they're measured, they're measured long. So the next thing I have to do is get it hung up in the trees. And then I'll come back and turn the camera on and make another video and show you how I'm going to use the MFJ antenna analyzer to tune the antenna. Remember, it's a little bit long, so we may have to put it, take it up and down a couple times and change the length. But We'll get it tuned up using the MFJ analyzer. Again, thanks for watching. This is Randy, K7AGE. Well, thanks for that, Randy. You know, I, I told him he had been a little cruel on that soldering gun tip there. It 
looks a little crooked on the end. But he said, no, if you push harder on the tip, it heats faster. So uh, good tip there, Randy. <laughs> and by the way, the, the Ballon, he says he uh, checked that with the antenna analyzer in his YouTube video. And it is a one-to-one uh, -one and not a four-to-one. You know, last week um, we wanted something to give away, and I just happened to have this Heil PR10 microphone here complete with the new mounting base and the LEDs in it. Yes, that's right. It smiles at you, and you can have it uh, when you push the push-to-talk button, which this does have a push-to-talk button on. That's a nice feature for a mic stand um, because, hey, if you're, if you're sitting there and you're going to talk on this thing, you might as well have the button handy right there on the mic base. But anyway, you can light it solid, or you can have the LEDs light when you push the push to talk button. But I asked a question, and that is, what was arguably the first digital mode for ham radio? And we got a winner on that, and it's Carolyn Bates, N3GZQ, and she said the first digital mode was CW. And congratulations, Carolyn. We're going to be shipping out this PR10 along with the lighted base to you. Hope you really enjoy that. And we've got another question for next week. And what are we going to give away? Well, I've got another one of these ISOTIP cordless soldering irons here. This is the quick charge model. And I charged it up just before the show because last time I did one of these, the battery died when I <laughs> when I went to use it, but I had not charged it at all. So anyway, if you'd like to win this, and why wouldn't you, where should the negative return connection of a mobile transceiver's power cable be connected? And this is from the amateur radio technician's exam, and uh, this is, as a matter of fact, one of the questions that we had on the Ham College episode that was released today. When or where should the negative return connection of a mobile transceiver power supply be connected? A, at the battery or engine block ground strap. B, at the antenna mount. C, to any metal part of the vehicle. Or D, through the transceiver's mounting bracket. If you think you know the answer to that and you want this ISO tip soldering iron here, well, then send your answer to me at hamnationcontest at gmail.com and you could win this. So congratulations to all our winners, to Carolyn for the PR10 here and to whoever's going to win this next week. Right now, let's get a message from another one of the people who helped make Ham Nation possible. And Out that's from the shack and into the sun. Brighten your day with ICOM's selection of handhelds, mobiles, and HF rigs. Step outside with ICOM's ID51A Plus digital dual bander. Features include free downloadable RSMS1A Android app, near me repeater function for D-Star as well as analog repeaters, and integrated GPS. Hit the road with ICOM's analog IC2730A mobile or the digital ID5100A with internal GPS. Both radios include optional Bluetooth capability for hands-free operation, 50 watts output power on both VHF and UHF, and a large backlit screen for high contrast viewing. Get mobile with ICOM's IC7100 D Star Radio, which provides multi band and all mode communications, and an angled control head and touchscreen for user friendly operation. For solid HF operation this season, try ICOM's IC7600. This rig offers advanced DSP technology and three IF roofing filters, dual watch on the same band and LED backlighting on an ultra-wide 5.8-inch display. Let ICOM brighten your day with their selection of handhelds, mobiles, and HF rigs. Make sure you visit icomamerica.com slash amateur today for more information on ICOM's complete line of amateur radio products. And you can tune in and enter to win after each episode of Ham Nation. Go to icomamerica.com slash ham nation and register for the weekly swag prizes, which will be uh, T-shirts or hats or uh, whatever they've got there from the swag store. icomamerica.com slash ham nation. You'll also learn how you can win the monthly grand prize drawing for a new radio. And for April, it's going to be the ICOM ID51A+. Plus like this one I've got right here, except this is mine. You can't have it. This is a 50th anniversary edition. You're going to get 
the ID51A Plus, essentially the same radio, just uh, won't be blue, it'll be black. It's a dual band, dual watch handy talkie with D-Star built-in GPS, near repeater list up, a micro SD card for voice and data storage, as well as data cloning, plus a whole lot more. So go to icomamerica.com slash hamnation after this in each episode of Ham Nation and register to win. And now let's bring in Val and see what's going on in the DX corner this week. Hello, everybody. Valerie and V9L. Well, as some of you know, I recently attended the International DX Convention in Visalia, and it was great meeting all the Ham Nation viewers who came up and said hi. Also, one other person I got to meet is Beverly Matheson. Now, she is a teacher at the Dorothy Grant Elementary School. She's also a ham radio operator. Her call is Whiskey Alpha 6 Bravo Kilo. Now, Beverly, along with a couple other dedicated hams, have been responsible for licensing over 20 of her students. And uh, I'm going to show you a little interview that I did with her while there. But before I do, I want to send a little shout out to Mike, one of our net control operators, uh, Whiskey Tango 6 Hotel. He was the uh, DP or director of photography for this video. So if you want to go ahead and roll that. So we're here with Beverly Grant Elementary School, and she's very active in getting her students uh, into amateur radio. And she's been teaching 18 years, and what were you telling me earlier about the, your teaching? I said, I started this club in 2012, and the first year at this club was the best year of my teaching after all these years, just to see how engaged the kids are in school now, and how excited they are to come to class. And, how much they just enjoy the radio so much. I mean, they even ask me, like, at lunchtime, we can get on the radio, it's always get on the radio, and they're always so sad if I have to go to a meeting or something. Now, have you noticed a difference in any of their other academic areas since they've been in amateur radio? Oh, absolutely. One thing I noticed that's a big change is in their writing. Because in fourth grade, students are required to write five paragraph essays. And generally, we brainstorm topics and we have to brainstorm the ideas to go on the papers. So the kids are making it up. And with ham radio, we've been able to have what we call our Dorothy Grant field days, like little mini field days. And we've had uh, at, uh, amateur radio operators come out and do things like help the kids build antennas and do electricity experiments and operate the radio. And then when they leave, that gives me authentic situations that the kids can write about. So they don't have to make anything up. And it's the best writing with the most details that I've ever gotten out of the kids. That's wonderful. And you can just see the excitement now. How did this start out? Oh, well, the way it started is uh, a couple of years back, I was teaching second grade, and I knew an amateur operator um, David Collingham, K3LP. I knew that he went on the expeditions and he traveled to remote locations throughout the world. So I asked him if he would take something from my classroom, sort of a flat Stanley project where we could track where it went, travel to. And he said, sure, you know. Um, so we created a flag and we would put a positive message on the flag that would be inspiring to people to come and contact me. What he would do is take pictures with the flag in all these remote locations. He would have people sign the flag, send us notes and messages. And in turn, I was teaching the kids about the geography and the culture and the people, about all of those things about where I'm like traveling. And um, anyway, so then one day I was searching YouTube for videos on Rotuma because that was where he was at and I wanted to teach my kids about the island of Rotuma. And I came across a video that a ham radio operator had posted, a 30 second video of his radio making contact with, of all people, David Collingham on Rotuma. So I captured that video and I played it for my students. And um, my students were like, why can't we talk to him? And I said, because we don't have a radio, we don't have a license. You know, there's a lot of things we have to do to, to be able to do that. So when he returned from his trip and he was presenting to the students and I told him what he had said, he's like, why don't you get your license? We can get your radio, we'll find something, you know, and we'll throw this together. And I was like, okay, so let's do it. And I was a little surprised by it as well myself, but it wasn't as hard as I thought. And uh, that's where it all started from. So every year since, we've sent flags on the expeditions and followed them around the world. And we have yet to make a contact with him while he's on the expedition. But I'm hoping that that's going to change now that we have some updated antennas and amplifiers and things in our club. And it's just amazing. You can just see the enthusiasm and, and how they're really into this hobby. They are. How many here, if you have your technician's license, raise your hand. 
Congratulations. You have your general. Raise your hand. Look at that. Hello, Hell Nation. Photobomb by Ray. <laughs> it's exciting to see how enthusiastic those kids really are about ham radio. Um, unfortunately, I had to keep that short, and we did have a lot of ambient noise in the background, and uh, my apologies for that. But uh, if you ever see them out there, they're, they're Kilo 6 Delta Golf Echo, which stands for Dorothy Grant Elementary. If you see that call out sign out there, that's those kids at the school. So uh, get on the air and work those guys. Now, as I promised, uh, over the next month or so, I'm going to be... Uh, focusing on different contesting and logging software and showing you some of the different features they have uh, so you can decide which one you think will work best for you. And they always say, go with what you know. So I'm starting us off with the logging software that I currently use, which is DX Lab Suite. So go ahead and roll that. All right, the first one I'm going to show you today is DX Lab Suite. Now, this is a free logging software. Um, there's a lot to offer here. There's seven different modules you can download. You don't have to download them all. You only have to download the ones that you'll use. And I'm going to go through these modules kind of fairly quickly just to give you a little overview. The first module is the command module. Now, when you open that, that's going to give command of your radio. As I turn my dial, you're going to see that go. Um, so it's really cool to be able to control your radio right from your computer on your command module. So let me close out of that. Now we have DX Keeper. This is going to be your actual logging software that they have in there. Now I uploaded my log in here to show you all my uh, logs. You can put in the call down here, enter call, and then you'd go into edit and you can put that you sent a QSL card or you received a QSL card and it will track all that for you. If they're in yellow, let me spread that out, they, they're an LOTW user. If they're in pink, they're an eQSL user. And if they're in light blue, they use both. So you can add a glance no in, in your logs. So it's kind of handy knowing right away um, if you need to send them a card or if you see that they're a LOTW user, just sit and wait for that to show up. Now, as it tracks and you record that you've got your QSL cards or it's going to swap back and forth between LOTW and upload the latest QSLs. But in the meantime, you can always hit this check your progress. And uh, it's going to give you your progress for your DXCC challenge, uh, worked all zones, IOTA, worked all counties, worked all states, you know, all these different contests. Uh, or awards that you may be chasing. So if we look at my DXCC progress, I want to remove all my filters so it looks at the entire log. And uh, you'll see there, let me spread this out a little more. And there's every, all the countries I've uh, worked, I either have it worked or confirmed. So like I have uh, Malta confirmed on RIDI, uh, but only worked on CW. I do not have it confirmed yet. Um, so that gives you a nice little tracking there. And when you get down to the bottom, it gives you your total. So I have 297 worked, 261 confirmed. So I have to get going and get those other 36 confirmed. Also, you can filter this what, in real time, what you need, uh, and just look at everything that's not worked. Uh, maybe you're on 17 meters today and you just want to work on countries you need. You do not work. Hit 17 meters. Uh, let's do phone only. And everybody I need um, on phone. And then I print my report. And there's every, all the countries I need on 17 phone right now. So it's very nice. You can go really into depth with anything you want to do. If you're doing the marathon or IOTA, there's all different things you can chase on here in different reports. Uh, I don't have IOTA enabled or the marathon enabled, but you know, you can enable that and then that will track that for you as well. Also, it will upload your stuff to LOTW, club log, uh, things like that. You can set that all up. You can set up different uh, things from your QTH, so it'll automatically put that in there. You can also do your QSL cards, design your QSL cards from here and print them off. Uh, you can even print off envelopes. You can also import 
If you use a contest software, you'll be able to import with ease uh, an ADIF file or any of these popular contest software, uh, contesting softwares like WriteLog, things like that. And then when you're getting ready to import, before you hit the import button, you can even pick the contest. So it'll track that for you. And then you would start your import, and then it'll take you to wherever you want to find your file that you have stored uh, somewhere on your hard drive and import that in. Same thing with export. You can at any point export all your QSOs or even just go through and filter out just QSOs since yesterday. And I've hit the since date, and those are the only the, car the people I've worked since yesterday, and that I want to export. And it says the log's filtered, and I do not want to remove the filter, so I put a no, and then I can hit start export and just save new. And uh, there's my three things exported, ready to be uploaded wherever I want to upload it. So DX Keeper is very, very handy. Um, there's also DX uh, View. Um, I really don't utilize this, but um, if you put in the call signs, it's going to give you headings, all kinds of different things um, that you can uh, utilize to work this guy and what headings and um, short path, long path, things like that. DX view. Also, there's Pathfinder. Uh, this is where you can put in um, call signs and it'll bring up their information for you, say on QRZ, and there they are right there for you. Propagation view, if we put in latitude and longitude, this is my latitude and longitude, or you put in someone's grid square, it automatically puts in their latitude and longitude, and you can predict how you can work them on which band. And there's, I can only work them on 40, 60, and 80. Uh, that's my old QTH I put in the grid square for, and at these times when I'm going to have the best propagation to work them. So, and you can predict long path or short path, uh, so that's pretty handy, uh, especially if you're chasing uh, certain rare DX. Uh, this is another one of my favorite features I use. It'll connect to the cluster for you. You can preset up your favorite clusters in the configuration, um, and uh, it's going to just start... Uh, showing everything that's spotted. Anything in red is, I need it on that band or as an all-time new one. Anything in blue, I've never worked that call sign on that band before. I may have worked this gentleman on a different band. Um, and I even have it set up so you can hear. It'll announce a DX for you. So if you're watching TV or something else, uh, just crank your speakers and uh, you're in the other room and it'll tell you who's on, and it, only the stuff that you need, it will announce. And uh, right now, I have it set up to just show me now the stuff I need. They're all in red. And let's wait for a new one to come up. These were all yesterday. 30 meters, CW. There you go. A lot of cool things on here. And this last option is Wind Warbler haven't really used this, so I'm not a PSK31 person, but if you are, uh, I'm sure this is pretty cool for you to utilize, so uh, that's a really nice feature. And what's really nice about this, if you do ever need help with this, there's a really good reflector where people answer your questions very quickly. Uh, the gentleman who wrote this software is great to work with and he will uh, help you with any issues you have. So, and it's free. That's the, the most wonderful thing about DX Lab Suite. All right, now I know I've gone long with these videos, so I'm going to be real quick about DX and contest. The VK9 a November Tango, they're still on the air. They're going to be there till the 4th. Also, Armenia, which is semi-rare, uh, they're on the air until the 4th. Uh, look for the Echo Kilo Stroke and then uh, their German call signs uh, if you need to work Armenia. This weekend, uh, the bands will be busy. There is, in addition to the Delaware and Indiana CUSA parties, there's what's called the 7QP, which is the 7th call area CUSO party. It's a CUSO party for all the states in the seventh call area. Uh, so again, the bands will be busy this weekend for all those state CUSO parties. And speaking of contests, I have my DX engineering hat 
And in it, I have my rookie roundup entries. So I'm going ahead and draw that live here for a winner. I'm not going to look. And the winner is, I broke my uh, gooseneck on my microphone stand, so hang on. Fred, oh gosh, I hope I don't pronounce, uh, Gokul, Kilo Delta 8, Zulu Yankee Delta. You are the winner of the DX Engineering Prize Pack. Congratulations. And uh, that's all I have for this week. I'm going to pass it over to Amanda, who probably has some insightful and intriguing and difficult questions for all of us. Right, Amanda? Of course, Val. I pick out uh, <laughs> the most horrible ones for you. And to put, just to put you on the spot, by the way, uh, uh, what would it be without putting you on the spot? Anyhow, nice to have you on the show tonight, Val. With that, let's go to you for our first question. Um, W3DDT Walt would like to know, if green stamps, the Bureau, and LOTW are not options, what is the next best option to verify a DX contact? Um. So he said, he said no uh, green stamps, no bureau, and no LOTW? That's correct. So, um, well, there there's, there's, has to be some way to get a hold of them. I mean, if they won't do uh, the green stamps, they might do the um, IRCs, the International Reply Coupons. Mm -hmm. um, so you can't really get them here, but you usually will get them in the mail from, say, Japanese stations. I know. And you can send that off to them. Um, another option is OQRS, but what I would suggest is emailing him and finding out. Um, some, some guys do PayPal. They have that on their QRZ page. You can PayPal them. Um, another way is if you send a, a registered letter to them, um, then it goes from postal carrier to postal carrier. has less chance of uh, getting stolen if, if the green stamps is an issue. Uh, but it's pretty rare to find somebody that doesn't want green stamps, so... Hope that answers your question, Walt. Thank you so much. Uh, nice shirt, by the way. You like my yeah, shirt? Yeah, you too. This is custom made. Um, I got my I swag on. I refuse their <laughs> shirt. I said DX Engineering. No, I'm kidding. Um, anyhow, did what I could tonight. And hello, Bob. Nice to have you on. Welcome back. Hi there. I, I really like your shirt. I mean, that's really cool. <laughs> yes. It's shiny. Said, okay. If I, I need a blank shirt and I said, I don't own a blank t-shirt. I, I just don't have one. So Heil sound it is. It's on backwards, yep. but hey, it, it works. Anyhow, Bob, I, I do have a couple of questions for you. Um, the first one is you, uh, you, you work a lot in telling, teaching people how to tune their radios and how automatic tuners work. And Dan, KN0MAP wants to know, what is the recommended procedure for using an automatic antenna tuner? I'm the wrong guy to ask because I never oh. use them. I <laughs> use resonant antennas and you don't need antenna tuners. But uh, George can have to help you, I bet you. Yeah. Yeah. That's going to depend on uh, the tuner and the rig you've got. Like, for mine, I've got a, um, a little Tar Heel screwdriver antenna, and I've got a turbo tuner, too, with it. I just hit the tune button on the front of my IC7000, and the tuner and the radio will talk and automatically adjust that antenna. That's not really a tuner. That's more of a controller for that screwdriver since the antenna itself tunes. But um, some of them, like uh, some of the LDGs, are set up that if you connect a cable between the tuner and certain rigs, you can just hit the tune button on the front of the rig, or excuse me, the tune button on the front of the tuner, and it will make the rig key up in CW mode. So it's got a little bit of RF so that it can tune because you got to have a little RF coming from the rig before the tuner can look at the uh, SWR and determine even if you need tuning. So it's going to kind of vary from uh, rig to rig. Some of them, you'll push the tune button on the radio. Others, you'll push the tune button on the tuner. And yet others, particularly if you don't have a cable to uh, connect the, the data lines between them, you'll have to key the radio up in either AM or CW or FM at low power and then press the tune button on the tuner. So no hard, fast rule. That's going to vary just depending on the rig and the tuner. And just one follow-up question on that. Does it matter what power you're running when you're doing the automatic tuning? 
Yes, run minimal power because if you're running high power, most of those tuners are sitting there with relays switching in uh, networks of capacitors and inductors. And those relays turning on and off with a high RF level on them could make a mark. So run low power, I would say, you know, 10 watts or less. Very good. Thank you so much for that. And uh, the only other question I had for tonight was, uh, and we'll send this over to Bob. Um, I'm sorry, I lost my place. KB2YSI Don wants to know, are there any recommendations for running an HF station out of a second floor? I'm guessing he's in an apartment building or something and he lives on the second floor. Any HF operation tips there, Bob? Go ahead. Well, it's just a little tricky in that you don't have a, a really good ground system and you're going to have some some kind of feed line issue probably to get it to the antennas. But uh, it's like everything else in this hobby. Try it. Don't be afraid to try it. And don't go putting three kilowatt on. <laughs> uh, is right, George? Uh, yeah, don't, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. Uh, you know, start out with, with 25, 30, 40, 50 watts. You'd be surprised what you can work with low power. But start out with low power and, and see if you have any issues of the refrigerator turning off or the television going crazy. Uh, just take it little by little and step it up to 100 and if you have more power. But I think that, that probably is the best answer is to just take it in little steps, give it a try. Uh, run one ground wire if you can. Tie everything to this one ground wire, not 13 of them. And mm -hmm. I give it a try. But I, I think that would be probably a, a, a good place to start is to just uh, take it easy and see what you got. You, you might be real surprised. I, I do a lot of stuff around here, I'll tell you. And I'm always amazed at what works and what doesn't work. So it's amateur radio. So have fun and uh, see what you get. And if something doesn't work, come back to us and we'll throw it out and see what happens. That's what this show is all about. Thank George, you so much. By the way, George, I, I already have my base and, and, and it lights up. So uh, uh, whoever won that got a, a cool deal. <laughs> and I'm using the PR-10, by the way, and it's a wonderful, uh, wonderful new addition. So we're happy about that. And, uh, yeah. Kind of fun. By the way, I, I don't know if I've told everybody, this is the first product we've done with 3D printers. Um, yeah. You, neat. To, to design a product, you have to make molds. And if you make a mold, you're talking about ten, fifteen thousand dollars to make a, mo a tooled mold. And it, well, we've changed this. I think Steve and Jerry's changed this at least three or four times. We didn't like this first. It was square. Then we, and with a 3D printer, it costs like three or four dollars. You pitch out a piece of plastic. But once you get the look you like and the buttons and everything going right, then you take it to the metal tooling and make your tools and away you go but I'm really uh i'm really proud of the guys this is uh it's going to start a new thing not only in high sound but everywhere 3d printing is going to take off like crazy now there's uh can do stuff like this but yeah this pr10 is an amazing little microphone i'm using it even on my uh my ancient gear so i'm glad that uh, you had that for a prize to give away that will probably get you some more and we'll have them at dayton and i also want to say I've had a lot of people ask me, yes, Ham Nation will be in the same location this year in Dayton, right beside our Heil booth in Audio Alley. At 10 o'clock on Saturday, we're going to have a forum, and they've moved it to the big room because in the past couple of years, we jammed that room about a half hour before we start, and that's it, and they're out in the hall. We got the big room, and it's uh, I think it's 10 o'clock Saturday morning, and then... Uh, at one o'clock, we'll all be live from the floor in the Ham Nation booth with Leo. And we'll get to talk to uh, all of America with Leo on his uh, tech guy. And we're very honored by that. So just wanted to throw that in there, Amanda, because I've had a lot of questions on email and even in the chat room tonight. So thanks a lot. You did a great job. And I really like your shirt, Amanda. Well, thank you. And uh, custom made only. Thirty-nine ninety-five. Everybody, send me your check. No, I'm kidding. I, I do have to make a couple of announcements that I, I 
I passed over. And the first one is for Katie Allen's mom who just got her general and her name is Betty, KB7 in AX, yay for upgrading to general. And Edgar in P4 EG just passed his extra exam and Barb KD9 no, yes, KD9 DTB just got her technician as well. So congrats, you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Well, congrats, uh, Katie, to your mother. And uh, everybody that's upgraded. I just saw a guy that listens to our radio show from here in uh, uh, in Springfield. We do every, mor every Saturday morning at 9 o'clock on KSGF. And he's in Detroit. And he's listening to it, to the podcast. And he got in on that deal. And he's got a handy talkie. And he's, he's already got his technician license. That's what it's all about. That's what this show's about. Mm -hmm. And we thank Leo so much for giving Amateur Radio this bandwidth, the time, the production facilities, and, of course, uh, Cher, Brian, and all of the, uh, the people that make this show happen back in Petaluma. So we'll see you all next week here. And... Uh, until then, we'll catch you on the air. All the, the uh, nets are going. Uh, what do we got, George, uh, on uh, uh, frequencies? Have you been watching where everybody is tonight? I've kind of been watching, but I haven't seen them posted. So I know 40 meters is going to be somewhere around uh, 72, 78, plus or minus a little bit. 20 meters is usually around 14.268, somewhere in that neighborhood. And Cheryl's going to be on uh, 2847 on uh, 75 meters. Uh, D-Star is reflector 14 module C, as always. I had someone in the chat room ask about that earlier. And Echo Link, star do drop in, star node number 355800. And I want to yeah. thank Dan, N9LVS, for doing the wiki for us every week. That's That's been a big help to Ham Nation here. But 73, good really? to have you back, Bob. Okay, nice to be here. We'll see you on 75 later Bye. on. Thank you so much, Valerie, Bye. Amanda, on George, and, of course, Gordo. And I'll, and I'll see you guys uh, next we'll time here. from Dayton, live from Dayton. Yay. Yeah, okay. All right. Bye-bye we'll we for now. This is K9EID and the entire Ham Nation team. Bye.